So what's what's going on? Oh, you don't supposed to do that once, right? Oh, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm a, I'm a slow print guy. What's good with you? How you doing? I'm tired, just you know, running like a fugitive, trying to, um, you know, write some scripts and at the same time um, get season two in terms of publicity, you know, out there. Yeah. Because the thing is, is that when you're gone for two years, it's like people forget about your show. Right. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, you know, I just want people to understand that Luke Cage hasn't gone anywhere and okay. we, we, we come back strapped. I, mean, okay. I, I, I can give you every single rap cliche you want, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? So for those that don't know, we're here with Che Coker, who is the showrunner on Luke Cage the hit Netflix TV show, Netflix and Marvel, actually. Show on a creator, executive producer. Oh, all right, plus, yeah, absolutely. But that's 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 even more important to note because uh, the show itself is is so authentic to not only the comic but also to hip hop, also to Harlem, and so many other aspects of it. So, for me, I always as a kid, mm -hmm. dreamt of seeing this come to life. Well, it's the same here. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, I mean, I can't think of a single other moment where I get to be a, the hip hop geek that I am, just on the music alone, mm -hmm. get to be a geek geek on the comic book stuff, right. get to meld both sensibilities, right. and get to be a part of creating a show about Luke Cage where I get to have Karis One and, and Rakim on the show and have Rakim do a song about Luke Cage. That's crazy. To Luke Cage. That's it's like, like I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you would think about and you'd be like, yo, how would I sell this idea? How would mm -hmm. I get this to happen? So the fact that it's actually happening is, for me, is, is, is absolutely amazing. Truly. Now, for me, I, I'll keep it real. Growing up, I had my friends segmented. So I would have my hip hop friends here and then I would almost sneak away <laughs> into another dimension and have my comic friends and my Dungeons and Dragons friends and, mm -hmm. and all that over here, like in, a, in the pocket, because it wasn't as cool yeah. to be like a comic nerd or a geek or whatever. Mm -hmm. How was it for you growing up? Well, I, I, you know, here's the thing is at least because, where, where are you from New York? I'm originally from Delaware. Okay, yeah. but even, even being from Delaware is cooler than being from Connecticut. Right. Because right? <laughs> I'm from stores, I was born in New Haven, Connecticut, was, you know, was raised in Storrs, Connecticut, yeah. which, you know, now UConn is a basketball powerhouse, but back then we were the doormat of the Big East. Right. I was always the only black kid um, in all my classes. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I'm saying? So for me, like anytime my cousins, you know, who grew up in Montclair, New Jersey, anytime Timby or Nandi, you know, came to visit for Thanksgiving and they were taping like Red Alert, or they were taping, you know, um, Mr. Magic, mm -hmm. they would leave those tapes behind, oh, this is corny, you can have this. And I'd be like, oh, thank you. And, right. and that's, for me, I held on to it really tight because that was the only connection I had to other people that looked like me and, and you know, at the right. same time, the music was everything to me. Yeah. But so for me, how my life was, I essentially was the black kid on Stranger Things. Uh, like I was always right, right. riding my bike over to play Dungeons and Dragons yeah. or Top Secret, right. um, you know, I was with a with a geek set that not only did you have to read like you know Lord of the Rings, you had to read the Cimmerillion. Like, like, like it, it was it was that level of geekdom. Yeah, yeah. I, little did I know that that and you know collecting comic books from sixth grade, thanks to my man Austin Orth, that um that all these sensibilities would one day meld with my love of hip hop and lead to an actual career. Yeah. You know. So what I would say is you know, it doesn't matter what your kids read. Mm -hmm. that they're reading is a victory in itself absolutely so encourage that you know yeah. Wh whatever kids have passion for you just you never know like what that's going to lead to so I'm, mind you i'm saying this and of course i'm going to tell my son to stop playing Fortnite. Right. <laughs> you know because they, they're obsessed with it but who knows if they become video game programmers then I, I you know i can't i can't say it's no different than what i ended up doing yeah yeah absolutely essentially you mentioned that reading part because uh i was talking to bob celestine he's a famous um lawyer in hip-hop and he and I had he's a bit older I mean you know not, and I don't mean that to put his age on blast but I, I mean that to say that he goes back and his comic collection is like 30,000 deep like yeah they were 12 cents it's ridiculous but he said the same thing he learned I mean not learned but his love of reading came out of that Absolutely. and the same with me my mom told me a long time ago when I started reading comics that that um 
my they conspired. She didn't like comics. The teacher was like, "He's reading. Let him read." Right. And therefore, I, I was allowed to continue to read comics. Yeah. I had no clue they were. Well, it's it's funny because I'm I'm like my mother and I only had really two arguments when it comes to like this this life or this world. Um, the first one was um, the friend that I mentioned, Austin North. He was gonna sell me X Men from X Men giant size X Men uh -huh. to X Men one seventy five for thirty dollars. Right. And my mother was I ain't spending thirty dollars on comic books and of course I'm like, wow, come on. Right. Second thing was when I went away to college, um, I came back from my freshman year for Christmas break and I was like, Mom, like, yo, where's my speeder? Where's my Death Star? Where's my X Wing? Oh. And she's like, oh, oh, this kid came over, he's playing with, he loved him so much, I just gave it to him. Oh. So just gave, like, gave, uh, come on. Oh, you know, give, oh, oh it, that hurts. Uh, it still hurts. Right, it still hurts. <laughs> but, but that's the thing, is like, who would have known that there would be an entire culture mm -hmm. of geeks? We always right. knew that, because that, the thing about geeks that I've learned from, from writing, you know, for Vibe, for Premier Magazine, is that everybody's a geek about something. Yeah. Us geeks about hip hop, are geeks about hip hop. Yeah. We have the same, you know, sensibilities and so all it is is that you're writing to be authentic to the to people that are gonna understand every single nuance. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like you just have to figure out like what the rules are in terms of capturing that nuance and then lean into it. Right. And that's one of the things that I you know, we always try to do on Luke Cage is like, okay, it's not just enough to have to have the character walk in the streets of Harlem. It's not enough even to be filming you know Harlem mm -hmm. like you want to mention like things that people remember from Harlem yeah. like the fact that you know like I, there was a there was one scene we had in episode 9 of season 1 where they were talking about restaurants and they were they were talking about like M&G's being gone right. or they were talking about Copeland's or you know mm -hmm. or even like you know we name drop everybody from you know from Fritz to uh, David Dinkins <laughs> you know what I'm saying yeah, yeah. I mean it's it's like but and it's crazy because then all of a sudden people will be like yo like like, I, I remember AZ, I remember Fritz, I remember, you know, either seeing or hearing about people from back mm -hmm. in the day. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that's the thing. We're, we're, we're just as inf influenced by, by Don Diva and Feds as we are by um, mm. The New Yorker, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, or Essence. I mean, it's, it's all kind of one continuum because the thing about Harlem is Harlem is both Washington, D.C. and Las Vegas for black people in one place. Right. It's both an entertainment mecca. It's also po black political thought. But there's also gangsterism underneath, and mm -hmm. I can't think of a better place to put a, a you know a superhero. Absolutely. How did it resolve the changing New York? Uh, obviously, Luke Cage comes out of the '70s, and, and kind of like black exploitation, mm -hmm. and now we see gentrification has taken over, and mm -hmm. and you could see people of all colors and races and creeds, walks of life yeah. in Harlem as well. Well, <laughs> well. One of, one of my favorite moments in television, wasn't even a Luke Cage moment, this season was the pilot for The Last OG. And, uh -huh. and, 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 yeah. and, and, and it's the moment that, that Tracy Morgan is like <laughs> gets back to Brooklyn and he's looking around, he's seeing people in the baby strollers yeah. and, and everything else. And he literally says, what the fuck happened to Brooklyn? Right, <laughs> like, exactly. Like, you know, like yeah, yeah. that's kind of the thing about Luke Cage is that it's a Harlem that we wish still existed, mm -hmm. but we also acknowledge the presence of a Harlem that's changing. Right. Because one of you know the criminal underpinnings in terms of of um, you know what Mariah Dillard and what her cousin Cottonmouth Stokes want is mm -hmm. to basically keep Harlem black. But what they mean by keep Harlem black is not just by color. They want to keep themselves in the black by controlling the money or the green that mm -hmm. comes out of Harlem. Right. And if they got to spill some red to do it, they'll do it. You know, so it's like they get their liberation through criminality. And so it's like we're able to kind of deal with the themes of what's really happening in Harlem, but at the same time, from a fictional standpoint, acknowledge how Harlem is changing. Yeah. Um, but then at the same time, use it as an opportunity to celebrate Harlem's history. Right. You know, and being true to that, being true to its hip hop history, being true to, you know, like little nuggets of, mm -hmm. of, of being able to mention. So, like, not only mentioning Teddy Riley, but mentioning the fact that Teddy Riley's from St. Nick. Right. And being just all these little things that just any little tidbit that you that you can that makes it more authentic, we do. But then at the same time, we're telling a, a, a Marvel superhero story, mm -hmm. so we don't lose sight of that either. Right. I just want to acknowledge that red, black, and green little <laughs> metaphor you throw there. I was like, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about season two of Luke Cage. Now, mm -hmm. first of all, let's talk talk to me about the villain. Well, there are a couple of villains. Okay. Um, 
on one, I guess the the new, you know, like like we say in television, the big bad, uh -huh. the big bad for this season, or supposedly the character that really upsets the apple cart is mm -hmm. Bushmaster. Right. Um, Bushmaster, classically, if you collect the comics, is he is a member of the Magia, so because mm -hmm. in Marvel Universe it's Magia instead of Mafia. Mm -hmm. He's mysterious and he comes from a Caribbean island. Mm -hmm. So what we do for the show is we take elements that we like from the comics and then we basically remix it for the show. Right. And so in our case, the, because of the fact that he's from the Caribbean, that says finally we can really introduce Jamaica. Right. And when you introduce Jamaica, you're introducing Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and so it was really able to kind of introduce new worlds to you know to our New York right and and because for me it's like when you talk about if, if season one was about the Wu-Tang vacation in the Marvel Universe mm -hmm. season two is about you know let's talk about the roots of hip-hop yeah hip-hop is rooted of course in the blues and funk and jazz tradition mm -hmm. you know as we take elements of that but also there's a very important and sometimes not really talked about Jamaican tradition Absolutely. that is at the cornerstone of hip hop. And anybody coming from New York that's that's you know has been to hip hop parties, particularly in the in the mid '80s and late '90s or early '90s, there was always a dance offset. set, yeah. and, and that comes straight from you know the fact that you know if you want to consider Cool Herc one of the architects of hip hop, mm -hmm. him being you know being born and raised in Kingston and coming as a teenager, you know to the South Bronx and mm -hmm. bringing that tradition. You know, there are a lot of, you know, reggae underpinnings to, to hip hop. And so with Bushmaster, we have somebody that can fight Luke Cage. Mm -hmm. We have somebody that can fight Luke Cage because he has similar powers. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we kind of explore some of the things in terms of how he gets his powers. Not exactly from the comic, but we do our own thing with it. Right. But then at the same time, we also have a character that is opening up the mysticism of Jamaica and, okay. and the language and the culture right. and the pride and the power. Right. And, you know, every character gives us a window the same way that um talking about cottonmouth and mariah dillard gave us the way to kind of really talk about harlem's intricate history right. bushmaster gives us the ability to really kind of celebrate jamaican culture and mm -hmm. and contrast it and also kind of like this war over harlem's paradise you know and contrasting that historically you know between the biases between wb du bois and marcus garvey mm -hmm. so we always try to like you know, my goal when people watch the show is to make them either Shazam and pause because they're hearing a song they never heard before, right. or all of a sudden it's like they're gonna stop and Google because there's a name they're not familiar with, or there's something else, and then like, you know, people just end up in these rabbit holes. So like, I, because I, really what it is is I really want people to kind of watch all 13 hours mm -hmm. and then watch it again and see things that they didn't spot the first time around. Okay. What makes you, uh, is that the reason why you gravitate to older school hip hop, classic hip hop? as opposed to something up to date, more low pump, for example. Well, okay. well, well, you know what it is? It's like, okay, um, Martin Scorsese is a rock and roll filmmaker, mm -hmm. and his musical sensibilities really tend to be like the Rolling Stones and, mm -hmm. you know, Eric Clapton and, you know, the, the 70s era rock that he, you know, because Martin Scorsese was one of the, the, the people that, as a cameraman, you know, filmed Woodstock and, you know, it was a rock documentarian before he was a filmmaker. Okay. I consider myself a hip-hop showrunner. Right. But my hip-hop sensibilities are older than Issa Rae's or Donald Glover's. Mm -hmm. So I can't keep up. Right. You know, I can't freestyle. I'm not in front of the camera. Like, yeah. so I embrace the hip-hop that I know, that I understand. Yeah. And for me, that's, you know, 90s era, Carhartt, mm -hmm. Timberlands, Champion Hoodie, yeah. you know, late 80s early not early to mid 90s sensibilities and and then giving that to a certain extent to luke cage um it's not really as much a bias as it is just like a feel because it allows you to 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 me celebrate a a, a new york hip-hop golden age mm -hmm. uh, and then at the same time so many even though rest in peace you know the biggies and the big l's have have, have passed right. at the same time you also have legends that are still very much with us like rakim like krs one and it gives you know an opportunity to um showcase them because they're still out there and and they're, and they're still vibrant and also there's a whole new generation of, of of kids including my kids that are only now beginning to get into you know the older hip-hop mm -hmm. what's the fascination as, as i see it with uh young kids and hip-hop and also these comic books are they going back to those as well 
Well, I mean, I, you know what it is? It's like, I remember like um, when Oliver Stone came out with The Doors. Like, mm -hmm. I had never really, you, know, you, you hear break on through the other side every once in a while, but then when I saw the movie, I was just like, yo, mm -hmm. let me, even though at the time I wasn't really deep into 70s rock, let me, let me find out more. And then yeah. it just opened up a whole different world. And so that's kind of the thing about this show is like, it's gonna open people's eyes to Mob Deep, to, yeah. you know, like one of the reasons that I named um, season one songs after Gangstar, I mean, you know, season one episodes after Gangstar, mm -hmm. and season two episodes after P-Rock and Sales Smooth, mm -hmm. is I knew that there were gonna be geeks out there that as they find out the titles, they were gonna basically make playlists and listen to the songs um, to try to get clues about what the season was about. Right. There's nothing in there. Yeah. But right. I knew that inadvertently they would, by accident, get a hip hop education. Right. right. And so there are people right now that as I've released on on Twitter the the P Rock Sales Smooth titles. They're making playlists. They're listening to these things. They're hoping for clues. But all they're getting is educated on P Rock Sales Smooth. That's dope. That's but you dope. know, it's you, you have to kind of Jedi mind trick people, you know, to embrace you know the real thing. And people don't know Pete Rock and I are we've you know we been at Comic Cons together see, with our kids and he's a huge comic Oh, no guy. doubt. I mean, yeah. because that was the thing was, was I think, he, actually you were the one that hit, that hit me to the fact that he was, that he did that mixtape. Oh, yeah. And, and, yeah. and he was all, and he, he was actually like sampling elements of the show. Right. And I was like, you know, man, okay. And so, I knew that he was a hip hop, that he was a hip hop geek and that he really loved um, comics, but then that was really one of the things was like I really knowing that he would appreciate it like that that was one of the other influences of, of, of naming you know the episodes after after him and sales music I mean you know that's love yeah definitely how has uh, Luke Cage evolved I, I saw the trailer and it, and he seems to have a little more swag a little oh, yeah you know what wh what's going on with him this season well you know what it is season one is about okay who is Luke Cage mm -hmm. uh, at by the end of season one he is I am Luke Cage right and then for season two it starts off with I'm Luke Cage but the real journey that he goes on is what does that mean mm -hmm. so season two season one was about embracing who he was mm -hmm. season two is even though now he knows fully what he is and what his purpose is it's finding you know um, purpose in that right and it's a journey of self-discovery and the Luke Cage that we end up with by episode 13 is very different and a different place than the than the Luke Cage that we start off in in, in the first episode with. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I really pride myself on, um, as a as a writing staff and as a team, um, what we did was we really were able to tell a story that I think sustains mm -hmm. um, thirteen episodes. Right. Some people have said in the past that even in terms of criticism of season one is that we were two we were two or three episodes too long. Mm -hmm. This season, um, there's a certain vibe there's a certain energy to the storytelling that i think merits all 13 hours okay. and, and and not to mention the fact that as many interesting things as we have happening with bushmaster with um shades and uh -huh. comanche and um mariah right. um and um tilda uh, you know who's a new character that we introduce and um you know misty knight mm -hmm. um and claire we also have importantly enough of a Luke Cage story right. and also because we introduced his father the, the late the, the late great Reggie Cathy mm -hmm. that we really have an understanding of of him right you know in a way and um, it's one of the things I'm most excited about which I, I just can't wait for people to see all 13 episodes okay okay I can't wait either I'm gonna get that that preview from Netflix for sure but um, the one thing I wanted to ask you is um, and this is just being honest we got to help Iron Fist out a little bit yeah, um, that was that was the one series I didn't like. At, I didn't like it, and I I read and I and I read, you know, Power Man and Iron Fist. Yeah, more than either by themselves, mm -hmm. and I felt that one came up short. So I just got to say that because that could be like the true one too. Well, uh, when you get to episode ten. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I'm hoping that you'll feel that your prayers have been answered. Okay. Because the way that Iron Fist fits into our season and his interaction with Luke and ultimately there's this fight in episode 10 that, I mean, that we um, pair with um, 
with Seventh Chamber Part Two. Okay. You know, from from Enter the Root. You know, like the, the bonus track on 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 Enter the Thirty Six okay. Chambers. Right, right. Yeah, when, yeah, yeah. when you see that moment with with that, it, man. Okay. <laughs> it's, All right. it's, you know, that's you know that the thing is, it's like um, I. It doesn't bother me that people have criticized Iron Fist on his series and on the Defenders. I'm arrogant enough to think that Iron Fist appearing on our show has a different sensibility. Right. And so it's like, you know, that's the thing. It's like, I'm not dissuaded by that because Iron Fist, I think, is a dope character. And I think when you see Iron Fist within the realm of Luke Cage and the way that we do things, I think hopefully it means that people are going to come to appreciate the character differently. And hopefully that swagger that, that he'll get from appearing in the Luke Cage universe and, you know, will carry over into, into the second season, which, um, which I, I think, um, you know, with a new showrunner who's, you know, Raven, who's, who's really, a, you know, really a okay. passionate about the character and, and, and also, you know, the Kung Fu sensibilities is really going to have a different approach for season two of that show. And, and really, because Iron Fist works so well on our show, like, I, I think it's, it's, it's going to be a good thing. All right. So the other question I have for you is, What's up with Marvel and the one-armed, <laughs> the one-armed superhero or villain? We got Cable, we got the Winter Soldier, and now Misty Knight is promoted heavily. Well, I mean, that, well, that's pretty good company because both both Deadpool two and um, Infinity War are blowing up at the box office. Yeah. So hopefully now that we have our own one-armed soldier, <laughs> that that's going to lead to us breaking Netflix all over again. Yeah, definitely. You know. I mean, it's kind of a, it's, it, I, I don't want to call it a trope, but it's, these are things that have existed in the comic for a long yeah. time. And so for the first time in television and film, you can actually match the sensibilities yeah. of the comics, but do it in a way that it makes sense and doesn't feel corny. Right, right. What's your um, take on Black Panther? Oh, what do you mean? I, 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 it's incredible. It's, right. Like, I mean, that's I, a no-brainer question. No, no. I mean, but, I, I mean, mean, as it relates to what you do. Well, here's the thing. Um, when Luke Cage broke Netflix, mm -hmm. meaning that so many people around the world watched the show simultaneously that we overwhelmed the server mm -hmm. for, I think, half an hour or whatever, yeah. it showed that there was a worldwide audience mm -hmm. that was starving to see hip-hop-themed um, black superhero entertainment. Right. What Black Panther did was it took what was previously considered a myth mm -hmm. and made it a reality yeah. by going after the same audience on a film level mm -hmm. and completely breaking everything. Right. And so the thing is, is, is that, um, you know, we all, with what we do, make things easier for each other. Uh -huh. So perfect example, like when James Gunn did Guardians of the Galaxy and he said, you know what, I'm not going to use any of this new you know, superhero rock and roll stuff in terms of like, let me put a new artist on and give them my yeah. soundtrack. I'm going to use old 70s rock right. and put that to, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy. And that soundtrack blew up and everybody was like, yo, mm -hmm. it made it easier for me to say to Marvel, like, I want to wu tang the Marvel Universe. Right. And so then after we have the, the successful wu tang vacation of the Marvel Universe, it makes it easier for Ryan to be like, you know, I'm going to start the movie with Too Short. There's going to be a public enemy mm -hmm. poster in Eric Killmonger's, um, you know, childhood apartment. Right. And because we had successfully did that with Big, no one can really say, well, I don't know if people are going to get confused or, you know, nah, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, the thing is, is that Ryan was able to really give them a full Ryan Coogler experience in addition to making it a Marvel movie. Mm -hmm. And it's that specificity and it's that reality and it's that grit and that rawness that he bought you know, that elevated that entire universe to the next level. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, is that um, honestly, it's like I love Black Panther and I really loved, you know, what they did. And to me, it's, it's just like, you know, I, I'm just so happy. And it's just like, like, like a, you know, it's a culmination of a dream, you know, because the thing is, it's like, you know, all of us being able to do this, whether it's Ryan doing that, whether it's the, the success of Black Lightning, whether it's the success of Luke Cage, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of we finally have the diversity in film and television that we've always had in hip hop. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, like, as you know, as a hip hop fan, like, if UGK, Outkast, A Tribe Called Quest, Wu Tang, and um, Hieroglyphics are, 
you're gonna cop all those albums. Yeah. All every single sound is different. Mm -hmm. They all have different sensibilities, but none cancel each other out. Absolutely. You know, even though, say for example, if you want to throw the chronic into that mix, it might sell more, but it doesn't cancel any of it out. You can be fans of all of it. Mm -hmm. Now that's the thing. It's like if you're a fan of Black Lightning, you're a fan of Luke Cage. If you're a fan of Luke Cage. You're, you're a fan of of um, Black Panther. Right. And they all help each other. And that and that's not that, that's not me even being positive and and the fact that it's a small world and we all know each other. It's just really we finally were able to do that in, in entertainment. Right. You know, and so I think that's the thing, because sometimes we get the question now, it's like, are there too many black superheroes? Hell no. <laughs> that's I, crazy. You know, because frankly, like, it, you know, Indiana Jones never prevented, you know, Harrison Ford from also appearing as Han Solo. You know, the, yeah. the, some of these things happen either simultaneously or after. You know, it's like all these things work in favor of each other, honestly. Yeah, yeah. What got me tight is that a lot of people uh you know white people were saying that black panther was racist which annoyed me because we've grown up and we've dealt with people you know captain america you know each one and we had to almost gravitate to like the hulk or spider-man because they had in their superhero form no they weren't white or black you know? well see the thing about wakanda is that wakanda makes you imagine an africa that wasn't colonized. Absolutely. And that's the thing. It's like when you go to Barcelona, when you go to Rome, uh -huh. when you go to Paris, think of Wakanda and imagine if there were African countries that didn't have to survive and, you know, free itself from colonialism and just were allowed to, you know, innovate in the way right. as they naturally intended. Yeah. You know, and, and that's all we're gravitating towards with Wakanda is the fact that to see that level of innovation, pride, and power in practice without dealing with, you know, colonization, yeah. that's what we're celebrating. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and that's the thing is like, you know, to me, the reason I really felt the movie was going to be super successful, it wasn't just, you know, Chadwick doing his thing as Black Panther. It wasn't just, you know, Michael B as Killmonger, mm -hmm. you know, being the compelling, the, the compelling villain that wasn't really a villain. It was the very last scene that, like, still brings tears to my when I when I think about it, which is that kid, you know, looking at that the quote unquote Bugatti spaceship, and then looking at at Chadwick and saying, "Who are you?" Because what yeah. you see is you see the possibilities of what can exist if we're able to, you know, move forward in the ways that that, that we you know with with possibility, mm -hmm. and it makes you think about okay, imagine twenty years from that if 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 there was a Wakanda and they were introducing technology and STEM to Oakland and to the Fifth Ward and to all over, you know, the country, like just what would emerge from that? Absolutely. You know, that, that, that's why it was that link from fictional Africa to America and the possibilities is what we as African Americans are celebrating. Okay. Now, we've seen um, time and time again uh, for example, Domino in the new Deadpool, or yes, it is. I, I, I love like, like she, she's, she's dope. She's, I she mean, was super dope. Yeah, super dope. But we're seeing uh, over time a browning of superhero culture, sci-fi culture. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you look at Star Wars in the '70s, it was all white until at least Lando popped up. But see, but here's the thing that's interesting about George Lucas was that one of the people that auditioned for Han Solo and from what I understand, got pretty far in the process yeah. was Glenn Turman. You yep. know, the, the, yep. the, the people know, you know, from Cooley High mm -hmm. and also The Wire as the mayor of yeah. Baltimore in season four. Or, or you're actually starting to start season three. Or, you know, it was, yeah, three and four. But the thing is, is that, um, you know, George Lucas was rare in that he, at the very least, could foresee a future right. where black people existed. Much how Gene Roddenberry in the '60s, in the heart of the '60s, had, you know, had Ed Uhuru, you know, Absolutely. Michelle Nichols' character in sure. Star Trek. Um, that was the thing was that uh, there's that old Richard Pryor joke where, where we talked about Logan run, Logan's run, you know, and it's like, you know, I think people are finding that look. I mean, if we really are going to be futuristic in the future, people have melanin. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's like mm -hmm. you, you you can't leave us out of out of that. Not just in terms of futurism, but also just in terms of box office. Yeah. What would you say is your, your greatest accomplishment so far? I mean, you, you've actually successfully transitioned from a journalist to television, to movies and, and Netflix. Um, what would you say is your highest accomplishment, achievement? Um, 
show running on four hours of sleep a night. <laughs> right. uh, you know, it, it's honestly, I need to get more sleep. Uh, you know, I don't want to say what my greatest achievement is yet because I don't really feel as if I've reached that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I just think. Spoken like a true overachiever. Well, I mean, but, mm -hmm. but the reason I say that is, is that it's like the fear doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. The same fear that drives me is the same fear that's always driven me. And it isn't like you all of a sudden, it's just like, yeah, I'm doing this. I'm, you know, I, I, I feel like that, that carers when I'm so-and-so, I'm this, I'm, no. The second, right. the second you do that is when it goes away. Wick, wick, wet. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the, the whole thing is that, um, you know, people have asked me before, like, you know, like, you know, I, invariably I'm talking about screenwriting and mm. someone will raise their hand and say like, hey, I, like, I have an idea and I want to become a screenwriter. Like, what do you suggest? What, what program should, should, I, should I buy? What do I need to do? I say, look, if you want to be a screenwriter, it, you know, it's going to cost you about $400. So like, what do you mean? I said, okay, so you're going to spend, you know, get a folding table from Staples, that's 50 bucks, you know, get, get a, um, a lamp, you know, mm -hmm. and then whatever you have left over, you're going to want to buy a comfortable chair. So like, they'll be, they'll be like, why am I going to spend $300 on a chair? Because you're going to sit your ass in that motherfucker for 9, 10, 12, 15, 17 mm -hmm. hours until you get things done. Right. So it's really ultimately about putting the work in, mm -hmm. you know, and it's thankless. Right. And there's going to be a lot of years you put that work in and nobody is going to thank you for doing that. Yeah. You have to be driven on your own mm -hmm. to keep going. I mean, how many MCs like practice rhyming in the mirror over and over again yeah. and then go to open mics or battle on a street corner and then get served, yeah. you know, and then they keep coming back and keep coming back again and again and again because the consistency is what gives you your skills. Yeah. It's not giving up that gives you your skills. Like, like to me, like there was that freestyle that, um, that Tariq from, from The Roots Mm -hmm. um, did on, I think it was Funkmaster Flex, yeah, when he, Funk Flex, I yeah. think he was rhyming for like 10 minutes straight. Yes, absolutely. And, Breath control was crazy. And where that comes from is that you're seeing the culmination of 35 years of rhyming on the back of the school bus yeah. and at the lunch counter, you know, um, before the show, in the street, you know, everywhere. Like, he, he had been doing that for so long, for so many years. Mm -hmm both before you became successful and after success that you get that moment and then you're just able to just go yeah and that's where that comes from and, and really like that's what hit that's I, I get when i see that it keeps me working because because i realized like you know it just doesn't stop yeah. and it only stops when you stop and you right. just got to keep yourself pushing forward always yeah. you know to quote the show it's like you really do have to just consistently keep writing and you have to consistently keep up on things because it's never gonna get easier. I mean, no, no, the money's nice, don't get, yeah. me, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that, but it's like, if the money is the only thing that motivates you, it's gonna go away even sooner. Right. Would you ever consider a movie for Luke Cage? Like, you know. Not, well, I, I can consider a movie all I want, but, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but the question is, is like, you know, are the powers that be, you know, going to let it expand yeah. to the movies. I like if it was possible. And there's a lot of business decisions that have to way above my pay grade that, I, that would have to happen first. But I, I think Luke Cage would, would be an excellent addition to mm -hmm. to the MCU. Yeah. You know. Um, but at the same time, it's like we also have a lot to accomplish with the character inside the Marvel Television Universe. Yeah. So um, what? What? Because people always ask me, Yo, like to see Luke Cage and T'Challa together, like we yeah. do in the comics. That would be dope. Yeah. But at the same time, you know. There's still a lot of things that Luke Cage has, has to do in the MTU, the yeah. Marvel Television Universe. Mm -hmm. So let's see what happens. Okay. And let me just ask you this. Like, so we, we deal with all these characters. And, um, you know, the, one of the criticisms from Black Panther was, and it, whether it's based in any reality or not, is that it's not black owned. Would you ever consider starting your own comic book world that's rooted in these people of color? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that, like, um, when you start talking about, like, black-owned, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, is that you just try to do the best you can with what you have, mm -hmm. and you imbue it with your black sensibilities, mm -hmm. and that makes it black. Yeah. You know, now, mind you, it's like, you might not own every single element of it, but that creativity will follow you wherever else you go. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I think to say that Black Panther um, isn't a triumph, you know, because of the fact that it's not quote unquote black owned. I mean, you know, that that's that kind of hotep nonsense that mm -hmm. like, you know, I just I certainly understand where the brothers are coming from. But at the same time, it denigrates the possibilities of people, you know, embracing the positivity and using that to inspire them to keep going. Right. You know, it's like people talking about, yo, it's like that's not black owned, but they're talking, they're, they're saying that driving a, you know, uh, a, a German sports car mm -hmm. wearing, you know, none of the clothes that they're wearing are, 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 are black made, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, it really depends on what level you're going to start talking about that. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to starting a company and starting my own imprint, uh, you know, that's not what I do. Yeah. That doesn't mean that I can't do that. It means that if I'm going to start anything, I'd probably start a record label. Okay. I, I, I probably would start something that um, has a different sensibility that is more in line with, you know, the place where I get my creativity. Right. Uh, because certainly, like, I'm not, I, I cannot do milestone. Right. You know, right. like, right. I, yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just not that right. creative. I, I think you have to know your limitations. Who put milestone out? I know it was well, Dennis yeah, Cowan, right? Yeah, well, yeah with the, Dennis and, and also, Dwayne, of course, the, the late Dwayne McDuffie. Right. You know, I mean, that, that's the thing. It's like, now, mind you, now, what I, what I hopefully be able to make enough money where I, where I could support an imprint where you could attract people, that, that is their passion. Yeah. yeah absolutely. I would love yeah. to do that. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, I know you got a lot to do, but we have to talk hip-hop a little bit. Always. So, you said you wanted to start a label. If you, if you could start a label right now, who would you sign first? Interesting. Um... I probably I, I probably would, would just go after like I'd go after Chris, Karis one. one. I'd, I'd go after Kane. Big Daddy Kane. I'd go after Rakim. Okay. I would go after um, you know Mecca from from from, oh. from from Diggable. Oh, that's a that's a that's a wise choice. You know what I'm saying? It's like um, you have a lot of people out there. Like the thing that's interesting now is that so many artists from the '90s are now finally free mm -hmm. from their contracts right. that the entire thing is is that you know they can recreate themselves they mm -hmm. can start from scratch my thing right now is where is the blue note of hip-hop yeah. where, where where you know because the thing is is like is like when you start talking about rappers with skills mm -hmm. like it, or ll was somebody else that 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 because I, I would love to do an ll record you know that i that i would call no hype man no crew which would just be l and like just making records the, the way yeah. that he used to just like literally you know have somebody have like you know um the one and twos put on blind alley or another break and just have l just right. just spit you know yeah, what i'm saying yeah. it's like the thing is is that you just have to kind of break things down to making real rap records again the way that they used to be made now if you can sample sample if not if you are lucky enough to be able to connect with someone like adrian young and at least you Muhammad and have them make original mm -hmm. tracks that you could sample because you would own, own you, you you basically you know would, would be able to make a deal to own those beats. Mm -hmm. Just make just you know straight up hip hop from those sensibilities mm -hmm. because the reality is is that Sonny Rollins is, he's ninety seven years he's probably close to ninety years old he's still making relevant you know before he retired I mean he was making relevant jazz records into his eighties right. you know um, Miles Davis was making relevant records till he died. Yeah. You know, Wynton Marsalis and Branford Marsalis are making records that have a older classic jazz sensibility. Mm -hmm. We need to preserve classic hip hop in the same way. Absolutely. You know, and, yeah. and that's the thing. It's like, I mean, if, if, if I could be a part of doing something like that, 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 that would be the thing I'd want to do. Yeah. I think it's there, too. I think that it's there to, to be done. I mean, most of those guys that you mentioned tour religiously. And even someone like a Snoop Dogg, continues to put albums out to this day that are actually really good records. Yeah, exactly. Even his gospel record, I heard. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 I mean, but that's the thing. It's like, I mean, you know, what, probably one of, my, one of my favorite records from last, from last year was, um, was Jay's 444. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. and the thing is, is like on some, on one hand, you know, people are saying, okay, well, it's not old man hip hop, but the thing is, is that he has continued to make rap speak for himself and about himself in the ways that are relevant, despite the fact that he's successful, despite yeah. the fact that he's one of the richest men, frankly, in the world. Yeah. He's still able to rhyme about his life in a way that's relevant. Right. 
you know, like, like, particularly when you start talking about the story of OJ, and he's like, you know, what, what's more important than throwing money in a strip club? Cl credit. Like, right. I bet that record made a lot of people, like, all of a sudden become more financially aware. Absolutely. You know, because it's one of those things that, that, you know, that we have to, if we're going to start talking about black economics and black dollars, we have to have better understandings, right. you know, of all these things. And because that, that was really kind of the promise of this hip-hop generation, was that we were going to be different than people that came before us and not getting swindled, not wasting our money, really building something. Mm -hmm. And I think that now we have the opportunity, because of the success, to really do that. What's the problem with hip-hop in your view now? Do you see any issues with it? Or do you see it as, you know, fully realized or evolved? Well, here's the thing. Um, when we were in our heyday, and we were writing about hip-hop when it was in its heyday, uh -huh. like, the most that we ever thought an African-American politician could achieve was becoming a senator or a governor. Uh -huh. You know, if you were going to do a movie about a, the first black president, it was a comedy. It wasn't a drama. Right. <laughs> like Richard Pryor. Or something. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, but at the same time, we always knew that the music had the power and the voice to speak to the voiceless, to talk about what's happening politically. Uh -huh. We believed in it. And we treated the Chuck D's of the world, the Karis ones of the world, the Tupacs of the world, as if they were politicians because they spoke to our reality in ways that no one else was. Yeah. The problem was, was that none of the people that I've mentioned really wanted to be politicians. They wanted to be artists. Yeah. The, the difference with this new generation is they don't expect Lil Pump or anybody else to be a politician. So right. they're able to purely be an artist. Yeah. And they can just talk about all types of outlandish shit. Mm -hmm. And they make money and they're on Instagram and it's great. But they have forgotten their power right. to talk about what's happening at a time that we need it the most. And, you know, with this Trump bullshit that's happening right now, this is when we really do need relevant records. Mm -hmm. This is when we really do need the youth to start speaking up about things and everything. You know, and I'm hoping that you know, this new generation of rapper will begin to embrace, you know, their power to move minds and move people. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement should be birthing MCs. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that, you know, I'm hoping that it does, mm -hmm. is, you know, rather than, than, than denigrate the youth and saying, oh, I, I don't really understand this, or I don't understand that, I'm not giving up on their ability to one day realize that they have so much power that they could use besides branding themselves and making money on it. Mm. Wow, that was powerful. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Ooh, we, we, we have those conversations a lot. Okay. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. I mean, you know, that, that's the thing. It's like, um, it's interesting because back in the day, like when, when, when Puff and, and when Jay first started making real money, you would have thought that the Earl Graves of the world and that generation would be, actually be there to pull their coat and help them yeah. as opposed to criticizing them because, oh, yeah. well, they're, you know, they, they don't dress a certain way, they don't talk a certain way. Yeah. So it's up to our new generation to be able to be like, instead of, you know, just criticizing the youth, mm -hmm. I really think that we at the very least have to, you know, have open dialogue so that they can learn from some of the mistakes that we made but they can also build on some of our triumphs. Mistake, and that would be going super critical at the youth. Can you speak on like the generational gap real quick? Like, or, or, or are we fixing that? Well, you know, Big said it best. Back in the days, our parents used to take care of us. Look at them now, they even fucking scared of us. Right. But now, the youth that, that they were fucking scared of are now parents, and they have a similar dis you know, disregard for their own children and not being able to communicate. Mm -hmm. So that's age. That's yeah. cyclical. Yeah. You know, um, I don't understand the newer hip hop because I'm old. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that yeah, it's no. not relevant. But, it, but it's not. But that doesn't mean it's not relevant. Yeah. And so even though, like you know, I'm arguing with my sons about you know mm -hmm. Rakim versus White Man Namir, like it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know what they're hearing in the music isn't there. Right. So it's really just a question of just having the patience to say, you know what, I might not understand some of this stuff, but you know, because you believe in it and I believe in you, there's something there. And see what we were able to do, maybe y'all can do some, something similar. It's right. just really all it is. Okay. Um, final thoughts on Luke Cage season two, um, to the people. Yeah, June 22nd, let's break Netflix again. 
you know, the same way that, that Black Panther broke, you know, um, the box office, mm -hmm. you know, the same way that by showing that we want to see a different side of ourselves and we're willing to support it, anything's possible. So, you know, it's not really as much helping the show as it is helping our ability to put out different entertainment the more that we support things. Because ultimately in Hollywood, it's not about black, it's about green. Yeah. And the more that we can show that we are not going to settle for the bullshit, the less bullshit will come out. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.